Good afternoon for those of us on the East Coast. Good morning for those on the West. Uh, I'm Ann Griner, President and CEO of the Primary Care Collaborative, and I am so excited to welcome you all to PCC's August webinar, Addressing Inequities with Whole Person Primary Care. Those of you who may not know the Primary Care Collaborative, we are a multi-stakeholder membership organization focused on strengthening primary care, the foundation of a high-performing health system to help people remain healthy and to help restore them to health. Uh, I wanna thank the Samueli Foundation who has made this webinar possible. Uh, they have, um, contributed to the PCC's understanding of whole person care, and we're very excited to have them as a partner um, in working to realize the kind of care that um, is defined in the shared principles of primary care. If you're not familiar with that, uh, please check that out on our website. There are seven principles, and um, that's our vision of what primary care can be. We've seen it in action, uh, but not in enough locales and we hope to scale that. Um, this uh, webinar is also um, related to a campaign that PCC launched in March of, of this year called Better Health Now. And that campaign is focused on moving uh, the, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, recommendations from paper into policy and in particular focused on the payment recommendations. Um, if we uh, can get primary care on the right payment chassis, we believe, and also invest more in primary care, we're going to be able to realize comprehensive team-based care that addresses people's uh, physical health, their behavioral issues, and can connect them uh, to social services. Um, and we believe that's the kind of care that all patients deserve in all communities. Let me introduce um, Cindy Hernandez Cassio, um, who's going to be today's moderator, and she will introduce the rest of the panels, panelists. Um, Cindy is um, Vice President for, for Health Justice at the National Partnership for Women and Families. She is an attorney, um, and prior to her um, post, which began March 2020 at the National Partnership, she served as the founding director at Families USA's Center for Health Equity Action for System Transformation. So since he is someone who's thought a lot about the connections between transforming our health system and health equity, she began her advocacy career at Human Rights Watch. She also advised and represented two Puerto Rican governors for federal health and human service policies in Washington, DC. She was a senior health policy analyst at SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. She's bilingual and bicultural, and she also serves on PCC's board of directors. Let me turn the baton over to you, Cincy. Great. Um, thank you, Anne, and thank you all of you for being here. I'm Cincy Nandescancio of the National Partnership for Women and Families, and I'll be your moderator today. Let's start with some housekeeping. All lines are automatically muted. We will be taking questions from the audience in the last several minutes of the webinar. You can submit your questions at any time in the question box. Also, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be posted within the next 24 hours. So today we will be diving into how whole person care can make a difference in addressing racial and ethnic and other health inequities. Healthcare leaders and patient advocates are increasingly calling for an approach to care that treats the whole person within their socioeconomic context. This recognizes how the different facets of a person's health are intertwined and that for healthcare to actually work to produce better health, it must encompass more than merely clinical medical services. Whole person care must integrate mental and behavioral health and include behavioral and lifestyle factors that too often are constrained by structural inequities. In other words, for people to be able to make better choices, they have to have better choices. So our questions today is whether that kind of model is attainable. Can complementary integrative approaches, such as managing stress and sleep, nutrition coaching and practices like yoga, as well as treatment such as acupuncture, be incorporated into care for all patients, not just those who can afford them. 
And how can whole person health models be tailored to specifically address racial and ethnic and other inequities? Today, we will discuss the evidence behind integrated care that includes drugless approaches, supporting healthy lifestyles and self-care, and deploying community services. We will, we will dive into how these interdisciplinary approaches can be successfully implemented in a range of care settings and what a greater focus on whole person health looks like for patients. We will explore how advanced primary care can reorient away from just treating sickness in a fragmented system and towards fostering greater well being and health equity for all communities. Today, I am joined by experts who have been tackling these issues on the ground. To save more time for discussion and questions, I'll try to keep their bio super brief. First, we have Dr. Catherine Subalak, is the Vice President of Population Health at Oak Street Health, a primary care provider system focused on older adults. In her role as a clinical social worker, she's responsible for behavioral health and delegated care management services within the care model. Catherine's career has focused on integrating behavioral health in primary care to create more equitable access to mental health in substance abuse services. Dr. Jeffrey Geller, the 2020 Massachusetts Family Physician of the Year, is known for his primary care health innovations. This includes development of the modern group medical visit, GMV models and protocols, bringing integrative medicine practice and modalities to underserved communities and community health centers, and developing fellowships and training opportunities to share best practices. What started for him as a goal of treating loneliness led to his work with open models, which prioritize human connection and are a major influence in the field. He has won numerous awards from the US Surgeon General, Congress, the AFP, I'm for US, and FMEC for creating the largest US group medical visit program, which helped patients overcome barriers to health. He helped found and is President Emeritus for the Integrative Medicine for the Underserved. More recently, he has started a nonprofit Integrated Center for Group Medical Visits, ICGMV. ICGMV has the goal of innovating, training, and supporting the GMV community, as well as evaluating major GMV concepts such as group inclusion efforts, GIE. Dr. Geller believes that ICGMV, in collaboration with Kronos Health, will revolutionize primary health care using innovative billing models to give patients, providers, and communities the time and support they need to create health. And then we have Dr. Kamika Lewis, the, res the Assistant Program Director of the Family Medicine Residency Program at Jamaica Hospital Medical Center in the Bronx. She completed her residency training at Georgetown University Providence Hospital Family Medicine Program in Washington, D.C. Dr. Lewis is a president and medical director for the nonprofit organization Tomorrow Smile Today. This organization fundraises and coordinates medical mission trips, most notably to Larray, Kenya, where TST has funded the updates and expansion of the medical center in this impoverished community. Dr. Lewis completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona Center of Integrative Medicine and leads the integrative medicine and residency educational track. Lastly, Dr. Lewis is a certified mindfulness and emotional intelligence teacher through the world-renowned SIY Leadership Institute. She utilizes her expertise in this area by facilitating and leading training sessions for executives, administrators, medical residents, and students. She also teaches these skills to her patients to improve their ability to manage social stressors, stressors, anxiety, depression, and chronic disease burden. So, Catherine, will you start, of, start us off? And before you do, Catherine, and so I just want to jump in here. Um, uh, thank you, Edward, on the PCC staff for putting a, a resource in the chat. I just wanted to mention that the Academy of Lifestyle Medicine has various resources for folks um, that may be useful, particularly for practitioners. And I also wanted to call out a book that has inspired me on this topic, and I know has also um, inspired Dr. Lewis. Um, Dr. Wayne Jonas's book, How Healing Works, Get Well and Stay Well, uh, Using Your Hidden Power to Heal. So with um, those couple of resources I wanted to put on the table, um, over to you, Catherine. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's great to be with all of you today. And one place to start, I should emphasize that I am a clinical social worker, not a physician, but happy. No, no apologies. I'm happy to both be in the company of providers and to be considered one. So thank you. And thank you for facilitating. Um, it's it, Again, it's a joy to talk about this subject. Uh, what I intend to share is Oak Street Health's approach to that. Um, a couple things to orient around how we address health equity is as a provider for adults on Medicare, we serve a little close to 200,000 Medicare recipients across 20 states, soon to be 21 states. In those communities that we serve, about 98% of our health centers experience an average income of about 300% below the federal poverty level, with about 45% of our patient population being um, dual eligibles or qualifying for both Medicare and Medicaid. With those experiences that, uh, that we see in our patients, we see that it does take um, quite a bit of investment, as we've laid out here, to have our approach to care delivery be inclusive of social determinants of health. So through screening, and we screen close to over 90% of our individuals for social determinants of health, um, looking at transportation needs, housing, food insecurity, access to medications, along with health literacy, um, social isolation, loneliness, depression, and substance use, we see that over 60% experience at least one of those. And then through our care team delivery, that in our approach includes social workers, community health workers, behavioral health specialists, telepsych working alongside our medical providers, we have been, uh, resolved those um, barriers to care in that approach. If we take a look at, at one more slide, I think Edward. We wanted to do a deep dive into one approach that we look at there, um, particularly with how we're looking at health equity. Um, several of our patients, and, and this is consistent across um, the U.S., experience mental health concerns. We know one in five adults experience that mental health concerns. Where we are located, almost 100% are in mental health provider shortages. So accessing mental health is a real challenge and accessing both same day or next day in order to get both the care that's needed for the patient, but also support to the care team can be a challenge. And so one way that we look at that in order to um, support functionality for the patient and downstream impact on their medical care is integrating the evidence-based model of collaborative care. As I mentioned, all our patients are screened for this, um, as well as all our centers having access to behavioral specialists, licensed, similar to myself, who's integrated and on-site and part of the care team, um, with then access to telepsychiatry, both for consultation and for direct care as needed. Through this approach, we've seen, and our results continue to climb. So on this slide, you see that we've had 43% uh, of our enrolled patients have had a significant reduction and sustaining that reduction in depressive symptoms at about the six month mark. That's compared to usual care, around 19%. As we continue to enroll patients, we've seen this number climb from not just 43%, but to uh, over 70% having that sustained reduction particularly when we have that collaborative care, care team approach. Um, and I know we'll get into this as, as my shared panelists continue to talk about their successes and different approaches, but a key um, success and a key operational piece of how we're able to do this is in our um, payment model and in the value-based care approach to take on full risk to what we see as a responsibility and our mission to take care of the whole person and address not just chronic conditions, but be sure that we are early and often screening for um, maybe what may be seen as traditionally non-medical responsibility to address to make sure the person has high quality of life and high outcomes in care. I'll pause there and pass it back to Cynthia, who I think is uh, allowing our other panelists to, to share their approaches. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, Jeff, do you want to continue? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, thanks, Catherine. That's amazing. Um, 
So I, uh, I'm Jeff Geller, and you heard my introduction, but uh, I, my whole career has been spent uh, trying to bring integrative and integrated care to people who are poor and underserved, mainly as a treatment for loneliness. And it's led to all the programs I'm gonna share with you today. I'm, I'm centered in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is sometimes the poorest community in the state. You know, they measure these things in funny ways, but it's a, a city in need. Uh, there's very low access to integrated health services. There's not a single acupuncture working in the city of uh, 100,000 people, or uh, you know, yoga studios are rare, those sorts of things. Um, and so we've been offering exercise, acupuncture, massage, yoga, mental health services uh, using group medical visit models. Um, you can continue clicking the, the space bar uh, on the slide. There's more to show there. Um, most of my career, the first 25 years, were spent at a, a community health center. Uh, the Great Lawrence Family Health Center, and we mainly were just providing uh, services. Um, uh, about three years ago, six months before COVID, uh, I moved to a private practice in Lawrence. I like to th think of it as a private practice for the underserved, um, taking care mainly of people with Medicaid uh, and Medicare insurances. Um, we too use a value-based uh, contract system to pay for things in, in this, uh, this area, but we also have something called direct contracting, which I'll try and talk about later. Um, there's a lot of risk in direct contracting that doesn't exist in the value-based um, contracts that people have. Um, but uh, in this private uh, practice for the underserved, uh, we take care of all insurances and actually we, we kind of have a robust uh, pay system. And it's really allowed me to pursue medicine the way I, I really would like to. Um, uh, we started ICGMV, which is Integrative Medicine for the Underserved. Uh, it's a nonprofit that's within the for-profit or next to the nonprofit in an old Taekwondo studio. And uh, we were able to get grants. Uh, the Sam Welly uh, Foundation is one of our sponsors, for instance. Um, but uh, full scripts, I, I, I shouldn't name all of them, but we have a whole bunch of sponsors who helped us get started but most of our programs become sustainable. Um, and the nonprofit mainly focuses on training people to do group visits and spreading what we've learned. We're a true nonprofit. I don't get paid to be the president, for instance. And um, you know, we started uh, group medical visits uh, 28 years ago, and now we're finding new ways and new innovative ways, especially with COVID, to uh, support that. We train about 300 people in group visits every year. We have a conference. Our next one's coming up in September. Um, and uh, I think there's a next slide. Specifically, when patients come to our clinic, um, if they have chronic pain, we kind of are like camp. And yes, I'm a primary care doctor, and we also offer mental health services individually, but we like to do everything in groups. You know, groups show, uh, seem to reduce stress, pr reduce provider burnout. Um, I'm pretty happy. Um, our patients are pretty happy and have good outcomes. And in our direct contracting model, if our patients don't use the emergency room and are healthier, we actually make more money too. So we're in, a, we're in alignment with our patients and wanting to be well. These are a lot of the groups we offer now. I think I listed there are 30 weekly groups we have. Um, our mental health groups are gonna be the newest ones and we're gonna have like kick butt depression, you know? So people will do kickboxing for a depression group and they'll have counseling and, and that sort of thing. Um, but you can see how we just have a lot more tools in our bucket to treat um, people who need uh, specific services that they can't afford otherwise. So um, I guess that's what I'll be speaking about, uh, how to integrate. And uh, we, we have massage therapists working with us. We have a chiropractor working with us. Um, uh, most of our patients are, are bilingual, so all of our staff is, is bilingual as well. And uh, look forward to hearing what Mika is doing. And, um, answering questions later. Thank you so much, Jeff. Kamika, your turn. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I work at uh, Jamaica Hospital Medical Center. That's in Queens, New York. Um, Queens is one of the most culturally diverse counties in the country. Um, uh, can't see the exact um, number there, but many uh, different languages, over 100 different languages uh, spoken in, in Queens, New York. And uh, so uh, that's where our center is, a community health center there, um, nonprofit center. And uh, at Jamaica, you can go to the next slide, we do have um, a capitated um, health system for, for 
uh, most of our patients, over 150,000 uh, lives um, that we are responsible for through a capitated system, and we are a safety net hospital. Um, many of our patients also do not have um, any forms of insurance. Uh, when you come, JFK is just a few miles down the road, and uh, often we do have patients that, that literally fly and come here and, and just establish care here, um, especially when they're, they're in need. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so, you know, being a safety net hospital, we often have uh, limited resources. Um, and what we've noticed is that often, you know, our patients' experiences are related to, to our um, providers' experiences. And so we've been trying to, to find ways to um, help the, the health of our, our providers as well so that it can impact directly to our patient care as well. And so the way that we've done that was in um, about 2018, the probably the fall of 2018 um, into 2019, uh, Dr. Roth, who's the chair of our family medicine department, um, he read a book, the book by uh, Wayne Jonas, How Healing Works, and became very inspired uh, about integrative medicine. At the same time, just in parallel, I had completed mindfulness training and started training um, actually our C-suite and leadership at our hospital on mindfulness and emotional intelligence skills, um, and it had been become, become very popular, and people were really um, seeing benefits from it. And so we met, and I, I read that book as well, and we were speaking about how we were both really passionate about bringing integrative care um, to our underserved populations and how we thought it could really um, be a game changer for our patients and our providers to be able to provide that type of health. Um, and so Dr. Roth actually, uh, you know, got in contact with uh, Dr. Jonas, um, we were able to bring him into our hospital. He did some trainings for us. Um, and uh, Dr. Roth was able to get a whole interdisciplinary um, team um, uh, created um, because we, you know, just mentioning it to department heads and asking um, employees, so many were passionate about it. And so um, you know, many departments, nutrition, behavioral health, um, physical therapy, uh, multiple different um, departments. And so we were able to start uh, coming up with ways to provide care for our patients and be in contact with each other and how to make these great care plans for them. Um, at that time, we also started implementing something called the Hope Note, which is kind of the integrative medicine of a soap note um, that we know in regular medicine uh, that Dr. Wayne Jonas created. We were able to implement that into our EMR system so that it was kind of a seamless way for our providers to start bringing integrative um, uh, plans and um, interviews into their patient care without it you know, being burdensome. Um, really what that brought to us was you know, the, the main part of that is asking what's most important to your patient. And I think when you're bringing integrative care into a care plan, that is really the crux of it because when you can ask what's important, then you know where your patient is at. And often we have an agenda as providers for our patients, um, you know, what they need to do to be well and what they need to do that will make them happy. But when we ask that question, um, you're often surprised with the answer you get. And when you answer that question, um, when you start uh, giving resources and helping patients with that, often um, they start to buy in more to your plan when they feel like they've been heard and listened to um, and supported, they will um, help you as well. And we have patient navigators who help ask a lot of the questions from the whole node and then um, provide us with information. And then they, they serve as kind of a health coach to our patients after we create health plans for them to support them along the way. Um, things that we've implemented uh, throughout the, the past few years, um, COVID kind of put a stall on it, but um, we're, we've kind of revamped is things like a long COVID clinic. Um, we've done group visits. Dr. Uh, Geller has been amazing and taught our organization um, how to bring group visits to our patients, um, which has been really exciting. I've had um, three sets of group visits that were very successful. So I have other providers um, in, our, in our healthcare center. And we now train residents in integrative medicine. We have a track for them. And those residents now have their own group visits, which is really impactful for the patients. They love it. Um, He's right, there is an epidemic of loneliness in our country and uh, you know, these group visits are amazing. The patients support each other and it's, it's a great way to help them. 
we also educate the hospital through grand rounds monthly um, to educate them on uh, different integrative medicine topics and how to provide that care to their patients. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. Our goal is in the future to have an integrative health uh, center for the underserved where we can do culinary kitchens, group visits, acupuncture, um, and bring all different types of modalities, mindfulness to them um, in one space. Thank you so much, Kamika. Wow, that, this is like so incredibly interesting. And there's so much interesting overlap in a lot of what um, you all are saying is important for, to make things work. Um, so one question that I have is, you know, some of you already spoken to this, um, but can you say a little bit more about what made you to commit to working on integrative whole person care. I know Kamika, you already shared a lot of um, how you got involved in this kind of work, um, but I'm wondering, um, Jeff and Catherine, if there's anything that you would like to share with the audience about that. Sure. Uh, sure. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I'm a family medicine doctor, so we already think that we take care of the whole person. And uh, it didn't take very long for me to realize that um, your community, your support system is uh, just really integral to how healthy you are. I had one particular patient, I'll call her out, Edu Vijas Sanchez. She was an older woman and uh, needed her toe amputated. But life went on. She was happy. She had a supportive family. And I think that same day I had another patient came in and, uh, um, you know, had maybe just a splinter in their toe and their life was over you know, they, they were, were disabled. And, um, you know, that awakening happened a long time ago, over 28 years ago for me. Uh, but, um, you know, more recently, you know, the, the work that's being done on the, the social determinants of health make it kind of obvious that your zip code is more important for your health than, um, you know, so many other factors, including who your doctor is and what have you. So for me, um, and then working with integrated medicine for the underserved, I am for us uh, as part of that community has also opened my eyes to um, the abilities that many people have for healing. You know, the healing doesn't just have to come from a doctor. It comes from so many different sources. That, that definitely resonates and probably similar experience uh, to Jeff, just early exposure, whether that was in family practices I was part of or family members myself myself as well as orientation around from a social worker's training uh, often what would be identified that would keep an individual from thriving in my experience was not particularly medical maybe it was an exacerbation of a chronic condition or they had recently been hospitalized but having their conversation with them it might have been something that was more we'd align to like a, a social risk factor or a piece that was missing that they couldn't find in the community I think the other common experience I confronted was that um, a lot of individuals would know, I'm going to go to my doctor. I feel comfortable talking to my doctor or my provider about this, but maybe the provider wasn't equipped with the team members or the knowledge to how to broker our service, whether that was a legal need or um, accessing food. Um, and the patient didn't know either, but that's where the patient felt comfortable. So being really patient-centered is what motivated me to want to work within um, this focus. And then what I would add is what really drew me to particularly the, the Oak Street health model was the ability to do it. Because I think working over a decade in community health centers, um, while there was the motivation and the passion and the conviction, sustaining the work was quite challenging, whether that was pieced together through uh, reimbursement or through grants, um, it can be very challenging. So working within an environment where we can take care of the whole person and that payment is either recognized through um, reimbursement uh, channels and or through full risk has been highly motivating to say, instead of like how many patients are we seeing we can ask the question are they getting better and if they're not getting better what is that reason and then build the programs to support that and not having to link that innovation solely to a, a medical or pathological solution thank you so much for that and you bring a, a, up a really important point about that it's not just a question of being able to have kind of the knowledge and expertise but also being able to 
to build the team that's needed. And, and I would say probably the connections with community resources that are needed, um, which is you know a key part of the recommendations of the PCC is like paying for the teams that people um, will really need to improve their health. So you also mentioned the challenges of it, of being able to sustain this kind of work. Um, would any of you wanna answer what you've specifically been tackling to make the, the models you're working on work, especially for people who don't have many financial resources? Um, and, and, and I should underscore, which also means that they're, as, as Jeff, you were so eloquently describing, they're in communities that are under-resourced, right? So there aren't many resources in the community either. Um, so who'd like to start? I can start. Uh, sure. So it is it is very challenging. Um, I do think that um, you know more awareness of the social determinants of health has been very helpful. Uh, we've created a resource. Um, actually, the program director, Dr. Vassell, has helped to create a resource um, for social determinants of health into our EMR. And that's an extra resource that we can now use um, seamlessly because it does become burdensome. You know, you open this kind of like Pandora's box of like what is going on with you in your personal life, which often providers are afraid to ask, right? Because they don't have that time in the 15 minute visit to address all these things. Um, so now we have this resource where you ask these questions and we can actually, you know, literally click buttons that connect the patients to different resources, whether it's a social worker or a community, um, you know, a community uh, resource that will help them with something that they're struggling with, which is whether it's financial or um, housing or things like that. So that's been very helpful for, I think, the mental health of the providers um, and, you know, more seamless for the patients to have these resources right after we address them. Um, I think that, uh, in terms of being able to provide these things, um, it's been helpful to make shorter, uh, more frequent visits. So before you say, okay, I'll see you in three months, but if you're starting an integrative plan with a patient, if you can make bite-sized changes throughout like maybe over two months, you see them three times, and each time you address something and build on it, it helps for the follow through and it helps um, you know, for their engagement um, and compliance with the plan. So for us, that's been a way um, to manage it despite the time uh, restrictions. I, I, I can go next if that's okay. So um, we're working on a lot of things. Uh, you know, we're really, um, uh, really grateful for the community we have and it's very important I think to stay in a community for a long time. So I've been in this community for 28, 29 years, and you begin to have uh, a lot of collaborative uh, connections where you trust one another. Um, the main thing that I think we're accomplishing, I mean, we're, we're trying to provide the best group visits. You know, how do you really facilitate and make people feel invested and connected and important? You know, how you make strangers support one another um, and uh, have that feel very natural. Uh, we are uh, providing so many services to the community that otherwise doesn't have it, mainly because of the billing models that we've chosen to have and so um, and the relationships we have in the community. So we generally get uh, grants like a community development block grant was used to start our mental health program and then you can bill for that and it becomes independent. Um, so, you know, some stories we have. Uh, are kind of amazing. You know, one of my patients uh, ended up going to college. She came back and worked for me after college. She went on to become a psychologist. She's now didn't have enough money to start her own practice. So we, we were able to get some grants so that she can now start a practice in our community. She's as culturally competent as you can get. She knows what our, what our patients have gone through. And uh, it's just so fulfilling to have those relationships. And we have multiple. We, we have massage therapists and, and yoga uh, people. And now the community has them too, because we helped support their talent and they deserve most of the credit. They did the hard work, but it probably wouldn't have been able to happen if you don't su su support a good community. And then finally, the direct contracting, it really allows us to provide the best medicine. Uh, different than a value-based contractor in ACO where they still want you to show your measuring A1Cs and and doing these things that, you know, my diabetic patients sometimes don't care about their A1C, right? 
um, but they might want an opportunity to exercise more and they may have stress in their life or they may have other ways that the diabetes is bothering them. And so I get to ask my patients, what do you think you need to be, to be better? And more and more, the answer is these integrative um, treatments. Our, our massage group, and I know it might sound crazy, we have a group and we're doing massage and it's COVID, but um, it's one of the most popular things that we do. And, and the best part of it is people connecting. Um, and then the second best part is, you know, treating the chronic pain issue they have, you know, and, uh, and doing it with as few medications as, as possible. So I think that's what we contribute. And then we, you know, the nonprofit, then also we train people. Uh, we have conferences so we can share um, best wisdom. We allow people to visit and learn what we're doing. So I think those are the ways that we, we contribute the most right now. I apologize for that. Apparently, there's some sort of alarm going off in my home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, Jeff, I absolutely love the way you were describing the importance of, you know, especially in communities where people are really seeing them as um, kind of needy and, you know, kind of a negative framing as opposed to looking at what are the assets in the community that need to be invested in. Um, and especially when you're investing investing in people, right? Um, so that's very, you know, I think that's a very interesting and important uh, part of what you were sharing with us today. Catherine, is there anything that you wanted to share about um, how it is that you are tackling providing these services in under-resourced areas? Sure, and, and I agree. I think what you're describing um, is similar at Oak Tree of taking a strengths-based approach. So, and I think Mika said this as well, as kind of what is important for the patient, but also what is important to the patient. And so what we aim to do at Oak Street, we often say keep patients healthy, happy, and out of the hospital. And that's where our sustainability comes in, is because we know from a value-based care approach, if we can have both increased quality outcomes and quality of life for our patients, and then reduced uh, medical cost, which can translate to that savings, then it comes back to us and taking care of our patients of what can primary care do. So getting to that advanced primary care, I'd highlight one thing maybe that's a differential is seeing our patients more often. So we're seeing patients as often as maybe 17 times a year, which in usual care may be a lot less. Um, our providers then have smaller panels so they can see those high-risk patients as often as every two to three weeks to really get ahead of um, possibly an escalation. I think too, and, then, and each of us have said this just in different ways, but I think what resonates with me is, is the recognition that no one organization or one provider can do it alone. So really looking at um, what is the role on the care team and then what is that individual, how are they working with the patient inside our four walls and outside our four walls, if that's the community health worker. And then if it is, it's the connection to those community behavioral health organizations, or um, an example being in our COVID-19 response, we partnered with um, food pantries, meal delivery services, leveraging our transportation where people were not coming to visits in order to get food delivery to the home to keep seniors and older adults safe and in their home, but connect the food to them. And so it wasn't something that we had to recreate, wasn't something that we had to come in and, and change, but more how can we use our resources and that approach to create sustainability for several partners in the community and build that trust to Jeff's point. Um, tackling several years of possible medical mistrust in communities that we're in and how can we continue to show up um, to support our patients knowing that primary care can be an access point prior to when they may get sicker or need a higher level of care that we want to prevent. Thank you so much. So I have one last question for all of you before we get to the interesting audience questions, which is always my favorite part. Um, but as somebody working in health equity for you know many years now, uh, I'd like to name specifically the issue of addressing racial and ethnic health inequities. Um, you know, for you, Catherine, for example, you mentioned you know generate in some cases many years, and I would say many generations of mistrust of healthcare system and the you know the the 
the additional burden of having to deal with a lot of these um, structural inequities, right? So how would you, how do you see the work that you're doing making a concrete difference in reducing racial and ethnic health inequities? Who wants to start with that one? I, I, I can start, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, it's easy to say, okay, it specifically pro provides things to a group of people who don't have access to it. I think the story I was telling before, you know, not just providing services to a community, but allowing the community to say what they need in the context of what they think health is and in their healing, and then have the community even providing it, you know, just creating more the context or the background uh, for it. Um, group, group medical visits as a provider, you know, most of my patients are Latina women in the, between the ages of 50 and 80. And uh, in an individual visit, it's a different dynamic than if you have a whole group of people who, you know, if I said, don't eat rice, uh, you know, we'd have a, a, a an interesting dialogue and I'd be told some things and I'd learn some things that were culturally not correct. And, and then we can move on and we all like each other and we understand where we what do you mean? From. No so, rice and beans. That's like a non-starter, right? <laughs> I know. Platano Madora, my God. Yes. Yeah. So uh, but it's, you know, it it's um it's really lovely. And I encourage anyone to do group visits. And it sounds like a lot of us are, are doing it. And um and just being open to not just what's been researched, but what what is the truth in this community and what does this community need? Um, my first uh group visit for diabetes, I was doing Tai Chi because some research had said Tai Chi was the best for diabetes. Um, but our group preferred salsa dancing and uh, there's no study on that, but it was the right, it was the right thing to do. I love that, I love that. Leading with what the patients, you know, know that they, that works. Uh, Catherine, would you like to add? Sure. I, I... Building on that, to agree with all those comments, I think particularly what's been said here is consistency and maybe showing up differently than how individuals have experienced in the past. And Jeff, you said that well in your framing of saying, you know, how have individuals received medical care in the past? Often it was top down and possibly patriarchal and said, this is what you will receive and this is what you get. Um, and I think that's from systems all the way through to the individual experience. What I see in the colleagues on this call sharing is showing up differently and frequently and consistent. And that consistency being Jeff saying, you know, nearly 30 years. I think that's the same approach at Oak Street is to say any one of our 150 centers in 20 states, we want the patient experience to walk in and receive that same quality of care with a full team of care, care team services with a high response rate. You know, we know often a difficulty is access. And so if we can target that right from the beginning to both be accessible for the need that's identified from the patient, whether that's a phone call, a chat, a text, a virtual visit in their home, telepsychiatry same day, that's kind of our first opportunity to build that trust. So I think that's, that's a way to answer your question to kind of how to do that. I think the way, uh, I, mean, I shouldn't say I think, I think what we at Oak Street often advocate for is beyond then our ability to do that is entirely dependent on payment and making sure then that um, through value-based or the full risk is set up to support that approach from a whole person care because it's uh, very difficult in a fee-for-service if it's about that unit cost or, or what is in this specific visit when we know it takes a whole bunch more of like a group visit, a whole much more resources or people. And so having that payment look at both social complexity um, what, through either the risk adjustment factor model um, and or linking it to Medicare Advantage stars and results there, we see as opportunities, um, perhaps not immediately, but opportunities to then address how we can make sure we can continue to have this approach or continue to sustain whole person care. Amika. Yeah, to build on that, I would say, you know, having the capitated health system, um, you know, 
we're responsible and so the the organization will take you know make some investments right so they'll they'll you know support us in wanting to bring like an acupuncturist or someone to help with yoga or we'll get one of our providers who can do it for the patient so things that usually cost money um, to our patients are now provided for free right so most of my patients you know they wouldn't be able to pay for acupuncture but now we can just provide it for them so i think um being able to have all these things provided really helps to level the playing field um i think in terms of being culture culturally sensitive and inclusive like Jeff was saying, you know, when you talk about diets with patients, there's this standard diet, American type of, well, not standard American diet, but like more of an American diet that you're trying to have them follow to be healthy. And if that doesn't match their cultural preference or, you know, what they're used to, it's not happening. So being aware of that and then meeting the patient where they are and, and talking to them about the foods they're eating and then finding the foods that fit into their um, culture and what they like and um, and having, helping them to find those type of foods that are healthy for them. Um, I think that's really important too, to not ignore that. That's a huge part of it. And then I think um, the follow through, like Catherine is saying, is huge, but also just really focusing on making the patient the center of the healthcare plan, right? And really seeing that whole person, but then becoming a partner with the patient instead of this like dictatorship is really, you know, it can really change your whole experience with the patient. It will make them feel like they have some autonomy on their care where often patients come in and just feel like it's all up to you and they have no control of their outcomes. You're empowering these patients and you're helping them understand that they have a big part of it. You know, only 20% of our health, um, you know, outcomes is based on what actually happens medically. The rest is up to the patient and what happens in the rest of their lives, you know, um, and their social experiences. So just helping them to understand that. Thank you so much. You just reminded me of like when I when I was um, pregnant with my son and I had gestational diabetes in a very, very diverse place like Fairfax County, Virginia, you know, there were I remember there were some Eritrean women who were asking about the diet, like, well, what about injera? And the educator didn't even know what injera was. Right. And so there was no way to 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 really address, you know, her diet. And um, so those are all extremely important. The cultural competence is so really important because it's not just that they don't get that answer, question answered, it's that then they're turned off for the rest of the encounter, right? Then there's less trust. So the more we can bring in and build in um, community resources and community understanding, you know, I think all of us are, what we're talking about is the same. The more we're gonna get um, better outcomes and better results. So this is this is great so far. Now it's my favorite part. We're going to um, answer some of your questions, and you all have been sending some excellent questions. And I am not sure. I, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to answer all of them. Um, so please be um, patient and understanding. Um, one of the questions that I'm really interested in myself, um, because I do have a, a child, is um, so a question about the integrated behavioral health care model. Is that working just for adults or are there examples um, where it's working also with children? Um, and I saw, I think I recall, Jeff, something about um, empowered pediatric group of some sort. I don't know if that's relevant. I'm very curious about what that is anyway. So Jeff, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. So uh, at the Community Health Center, we had what we called empowerment groups. Uh, they were funded by uh, the New Balance Foundation at that time, but they, they generated their own revenue. Uh, it was for kids who are overweight, so you can bill for the overweight. We did research on, on the project, though, and the main outcome was less anxiety and less stress. Mm. And, uh, you know, of course, that was correlated with losing weight and being happier and healthier. Um, but uh, you know, children, it's a little more complicated. We offer family groups and, and children uh, groups. We've had attention deficit, for instance, sometimes you pick a topic um, or a reason to group people together. And so there's some benefit just by doing a group visit and having, having people do that. Uh, starting in October, we have a um, psychologist who will be joining us, that same person I was telling you about, my uh, student friend, past worker, you know, she, we're gonna start her practice here. And on Mondays, she's going to facilitate groups with children using her expertise in psychology. 
and uh, people will get individual visits and then they're going to be put into mental health exercise type groups together um you know it, it has been very difficult to find people who can test and assess children for learning differences um to uh, help families especially with covid where you know suddenly you're learning at home with a screen um so i won't speak too much because maybe my my friends here have more to say but um the uh you know whole health should start from childhood maybe it should start in schools maybe it should start in communities maybe it starts in preschools um by the time i generally see see kids you know they're they're it's already like oh no there's a problem we got to figure out <laughs> anybody else want to chime in Catherine, I, can, I know I can... that you oak, oak yeah. street is mostly seniors but i wonder if in any of your experiences you have um an answer for that certainly um I'll speak to a couple things. So you're correct at Oak Street Health, we're for adults on Medicare. I will mention that about one in four of our patients um, is falls into that 18 to 60 because of their qualifications that I mentioned for duals. So we certainly see this results inclusive of adults. But for pediatrics, my decade before Oak Street was working at, as I mentioned, FQHC and similar approach, we operate the collaborative care model that's out of University of Washington, often re referred to either as the impact model or AIMS. And there are over 80 um, RCTs that demonstrate the evidence that is also inclusive of pediatrics. So um, I'd say what, what, what I've seen play out in both the literature and in practice, when there is that um, operational excellence to the fidelity of the model of both population-based care of screening. So to Jeff's point, making sure you're using validated screening tools and then leveraging those screening tools to enroll patients, whether they're pediatrics or adults, um, and then having what we call treat to target. So making sure that you're having that therapeutic response um, and engaging the patient. It is often dependent on having partners though. That's what I would say that's probably the burden on much of our system, uh, mental health shortages um, and our advocacy around um, the inclusion of not only social workers in that uh, payment, but also what's up for 2023 of inclusion of uh, licensed professional counselors and other individuals that can partner with primary care providers um, to make sure that we can treat any age early so it's not waiting for that mental health crisis but yes to the short answer to the question collaborative care is validated in peds and can definitely integrate it mika did you want to jump in um briefly I, I think both catherine and jeff really answered the question well i think for us you know um identifying early is our usually our key um to you know even when um you know kids are two three four years old just identifying these markers that you know they're heading towards obesity or you know looking having really good social screening when you're meeting with the parents and and um identifying any developmental things early um is the key to intervention to then provide them with the resources um to help them we don't currently have a group visit for peds or anything like that yet um hopefully in the future but I do think, um, as Jeff is showing, that it, it's, it would be extremely beneficial for them, especially after the pandemic, because I've seen more anxiety and depression in my pediatric patients than I've ever seen before um, since this isolation has happened. Thank you so much. So the, here's a very, very specific question. Um, uh, I'm finding within my health organization that the family practice internal medicine and specialties are resistant to the whole person way of thinking. If the patient is not Caucasian, they feel it is more of a burden, especially if the patient is not established yet and NP acute. How would I go about emphasizing comfortably in diversity, encouraging whole person care? So this is about, you know, how do you get others to jump into this model when it means that they're gonna have to stretch themselves more, right? And it's not just what the typical thing that they're comfortable with. I think that if you want to engage those providers who are already often burnt out and overwhelmed, um, you're going to have to, um, I think that it helps when you experience it yourself. 
to then understand the impact that can, it can have in others because that's how it worked for me. I, I had no idea how impactful these modalities could be until I, I started experience, you know, trying them myself. So I think if you want your providers to do that, you have to provide them with some exposure to this, some education on it, um, and then also have support systems in place for them when you want them to start implementing this of places to actually refer their patients that are gonna support their patients and, and have things in place like a health coach or um, you know some type of patient navigator or support system. Because if you just tell a provider, oh, we want you to implement this and they don't even understand it themselves, I'm not sure how it's gonna be effective at all. So if the, if the providers are resistant, they just don't have education on it. Yeah, I, I've always kind of uh, thought that part of the challenge is that a lot of us think about like the provider needs to do all these things when really what we're talking about is that there needs to be a team that can do all of these things um, and not necessarily the provider who still may only have 15 minutes, um, but that there's a whole team around that. Um, Catherine or Jeff, is there anything you wanted to add to answer that question? So they are, um, they are, there are currently at least two or three organizations that can come from the outside and provide group visits for providers. Um, I think group visits are, they've already shown to save money. Our practice, we're a small practice of four or five physicians using these direct care models and uh, we're saving money. And so we can reinvest it then into, uh, into programs. And yeah, you don't need a physician leading a group visit, especially one who may not be good at facilitating those things. And so, um, you know, there are people from the community who could be perfectly great people who I've had some groups that have existed for 25 years. They don't need me to run them. And so, um, you know, Kamika's point is, is right on target. But um, yeah, I think they're going to be because of the success in saving money that group visits has, even though that may not be the main reason to do them. Uh, there will be people who, who figure out how to uh, how to kind of facilitate them from the outside. Catherine, we have one minute if you have a quick answer. Well, probably only our perspective, which would be to validate the resistance if it's about getting buy-in, that I think that resistance comes from a place that the incentives aren't aligned with the outcomes. And so it's incredibly challenging if you're trying to retrofit a fee-for-service setup to make a case for integrated care or whole person care. Um, and so just, again, beating that drum of aligning the incentives or the payment with then what we know to be beneficial to both the system and the patient experience. Thank you so much for that. I think uh, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege for a moment and say that especially this concern about white, you know, Caucasian providers maybe not feeling equipped to be able to do this with um, diverse patients that there's probably a role also for kind of some internal, you know, anti-racism, um, diversity, implicit bias trainings that um, have been shown will make, you know, can also make a difference in people feeling like they can have these sometimes sensitive conversations about how a person's life is going, right? So anyway, um, we've run out of time uh, and this, and I wish, you know, we still had so many more questions that were awesome. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time, but I need to close off now. So on behalf of the Primary Care Collaborative, I want to thank the panelists for the contributions um, and the audience for their engagement on this really important topic. I also want to uh, give a special thank you to the Samueli Foundation for making this possible. And please join us next month for the next webinar. Thank you so much, all of you, and um, see you in a month. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.